Hello, everyone. It is time for our mobile device management and Intune webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Shelley Reed. I am the manager of the Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, and we're happy that you've joined us today. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Tony Liu, and they're going to give you introductions on everyone speaking today. So thank you for joining, and let's get started. Great. Thank you, Shelley. Um, so to start off, we'll, we'll just go over the uh, roadmap for our presentation today on the agenda. Um, so we'll talk generally about uh, what MDM is and uh, what uh, Intune offers, and then uh, go into a discussion about basic process for implementation, um, some policy decision discussion, and then um, training. Oh, looks like the slides are... <laughs> Yeah, um, training and help desk issues, and then um, a discussion about how MDM and bring your own device kind of overlaps, um, and then we'll have some time for some question and answer. Um, before we dive in, um, some introductions. So I am Tony Liu. I'm a senior consultant at Just Tech. Uh, and with us, we also have uh, Amanda Revels, who's the chief Operating Officer at the Michigan Advocacy Project, and Joseph Mello, the Director of Engineering at Just Tech. Um, I think we might have skipped a slide. Or, sorry, maybe my slides are out of order. Okay, we could try the next slide, please. Okay, well, so before we talk about uh, MDM and Intune, we're, let's, we're going to uh, do a quick poll just to understand uh, your role and uh, who's, who's in attendance right now. So if we could see the poll results once we have a good number of responses. Okay, so it looks like, uh, you know, almost half IT staff, which uh, sounds about right for something that's uh, potentially with a title that sounds so technical. Um, but it's also good to know that there are some uh, some management level folks as well as um, other, other staff here to learn about this topic. Um, yeah, and, and you know the presentation kind of covers some of the more technical aspects, but also a lot of the policy and kind of um, internal business culture aspects as well. So hopefully there's going to be uh, something for everyone in, in, in this presentation. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, let's start off with a conversation about what uh, MDM or mobile device management is. Um, so generally it's, you know, you can think of it as uh, the administration of mobile devices and applications um, and content on those mobile devices. So, but there are a lot of specific terms and acronyms that you might hear. So uh, MDM or mobile device management um, is regarded kind of more specifically as man management of devices themselves. So smartphones, tablets, laptops. Um, MDM came first out of that came a need to kind of expand management as um, mobile device use became more complex. And so another term called enterprise mobility management or EMM kind of grew out of that. And it's kind of like an MDM plus, right? So you're, it's also about managing applications and contents on those devices and um, and has, uh, you know, more advanced analytics and security features than, you know, the original MDM uh, solutions. And then there's also a term called unified endpoint management or UEM. And that often is, re you know, referring to things like um, internet connected printers and other other types of uh, internet of things types devices. Um, all of these terms sometimes get used interchangeably and in overlapping ways. So just for our purposes today, when we say MDM, we are talking about not just managing mobile devices, but also sometimes the applications and the content on those devices. Um, but you know, I think a lot of in a lot of ways, MDM has come to 
sort of be the generic term that a lot of people use. And, um, and uh, Joseph, can you tell us a little bit about Microsoft Intune specifically? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Microsoft Intune, I'd say, has evolved quite a bit since when it first came out. Um, and in usual Microsoft fashion, they're sort of cobbling things together to fit into the world of Intune. And I'm sure at some point they'll probably change the name to it. But uh, right now it, it essentially can do the mobile device management side of things for users and devices. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, there's also the capabilities to do app deployment and management. So if you wanted to be able to roll out, say Adobe Read it to every, everyone's like laptops, essentially, you could do it that way through the app deployment. Uh, there's also a lot of policy-based type of things that you could do inside uh, Intune. So there's application policies, device policies. Device policies are kind of like group policy in um, the regular on-prem Active Directory. There's compliance policies. So you could you could set something that says you must have this version of the operating system in order for you to be considered compliant. Uh, there's conditional policies that you can set. Uh, like requiring that somebody has MFA turned on or that you're within the United States and that's considered within the conditional policy. Uh, Intune is also capable of doing uh, endpoint detection and response. So it's, it's Microsoft's uh, like antivirus product. Uh, there's also autopilot, which can do the like OS deployment type of situation. Uh, you can essentially get a computer and have autopilot get uh, Windows provision and the applications deployed to the device. And then there's also the baked in Windows updates. You can control Windows updates, which essentially replaces the um, the old on-premise products that existed before. Great, yeah, that's a that's a lot, and we'll we'll dive into some of that some more. But um, maybe Amanda, you can talk to us a little bit about why why an organization might need this. Sure. Uh, so I will say that um, number one, I think Maps' biggest reason for moving to Microsoft and, and Intune was because we needed a more efficient process, both for our device deployment and also for our device management. Um, and I think that was both on our IT support team side as well as our end user side. Um, MAP has grown, we've actually tripled almost in size since the beginning of COVID. So with that comes triple the amount of machines that you have to maintain, manage, you know, um, send updates to, make sure that stay up to date. Um, and I will say that when MAP moved to the Microsoft uh, platform, we made a really big change inside our organization because not only did we um, begin to use Intune, we also worked with Dell to begin to use um, Autopilot. And we also uh, moved about 11 on-premise file servers, uh, Linux file servers to SharePoint. So this was a huge change for our um, organization. And um, part of the reason why we, um, made that change was all because of cost and efficiency. Our, our previous process was just, um, it was very manual, it was very time consuming, it required a lot of IT overhead and time. Um, it just wasn't an efficient system. Um, I also think that with Intune, we have a, a, a really increased our security and visibility as far as um, all the devices that we have in our program. Um, and Intune just requires much less time to manage. Um, I think it makes it much easier for our IT team to enforce policies on laptops, smartphones, um, both. I will also say, I know we talk about this later, um, but personal devices as well as uh, map owned devices. Um, and it also gives us control when a device goes lost, stolen, misplaced um, um, over what, what happens with that device and the data on that device. Um, it's also um, talking about SharePoint, it's also made us much more efficient um, because we can now back up all of our SharePoint sites to one place. So we don't have to maintain all of that equipment that we had with our on-premise um, file servers. And I think last, I think it's much uh, better for our help desk support. Um, we used to have um, images that depending on when they were deployed, they were all different. Um, so our help desk staff never knew when they connected to a machine, um, which image, uh, was on that machine. With um, Intune, you know, our help desk staff can connect to a machine. Everything is is um, set up the same. It's all just very consistent. They can see in Intune which apps that machine has, um, which versions of those apps they have. It's, just, it's all very transparent as opposed to our old um, setup that we had. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So this is just a, a kind of a visual representation of a lot of the features that that Joseph and Amanda were kind of referencing. Um, 
and to just to kind of give you a sense of you know how how comprehensive it can be and um, how effective it can kind of be to give IT and um, an organization the ability to kind of handle all of this um, in one uh, in one specific platform. Great. So. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the process for implementing it. It is, uh, it's not necessarily something that you just flip a switch. Um, so, uh, Amanda, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about your process. Sure. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that we had to look at in the, the beginning was um, our equipment. Um, like any other nonprofit, we did have some older equipment that was, um, say, five, six years old. And so one of our concerns was if the equipment that we had would be up to date enough to um, facilitate this this uh, upgrade to Intune. Um, I will say that we only, we had a very small handful of machines that actually were not, that we were not able to um, uh, to use once we went through this whole change. So that was actually a, a pleasant surprise for us. Um, we did a lot of communication with staff um, several months prior to this change, um, what would take place, what they could expect, um, when those things would occur. And I think that that communication to staff was very helpful um, for users just to adapt a little bit more easily when all of these changes happen. Um, I will say also, um, this is kind of one of those things, hindsight, you look back. Um, right after making this change, um, I will say just months after this change, um, COVID hit. And so we did purchase a pretty large amount of laptops that obviously were all new devices, um, worked very well in Intune, but had we not made this change to um, to, to begin to use Intune, we would it, it would have been a mess for us to try to order all these laptops, get them out to staff, send them to the office, to their houses, get them all registered, get people logged in, accounts set up. Um, because we were using that autopilot process through Dell, we, did, we were able to just ship those machines and they were all set up and ready to go. So that was a huge time saving for us at a time when we were already kind of buried in, in work. So um, one important thing I think to note is the way that we set up our um, Intune setup, it did require us to move from, at the time we had a free um, Microsoft licensing um, process set up through TechSoup. We did have to move to a Microsoft 365 E3 license, which does have a cost associated to it. Um, but I think that through TechSoup, we were able to get about a 75% discount um, off of the retail price from Microsoft. Um, and I, I know this this whole webinar is mostly focused on Intune, but I will say, talking about preparation, because we also um, decommissioned all those on-prem file servers to um, SharePoint sites, that was probably one of the biggest hurdles that we had was um, migrating all of that data to SharePoint. That was a huge undertaking. Um, I think anybody who's thinking about that, that's an important thing. I just want to note to to kind of keep in mind. Um, we it was because of bandwidth. It just took us. It was very very time consuming to to get all of that migrated over to SharePoint. Great. And um, <clears throat> Joseph, can you talk a little bit about um, the uh, the app deployment and management and monitoring and reporting? Yeah, so with the app deployment, which was one of the things that I mentioned earlier that Intune can do, um, one of the, the more easier methods would be you can go to the Microsoft store using Intune and essentially say, I want to deploy what's in the Microsoft catalog. And Microsoft, of course, has a lot of things that are in there um, that's available to you. I mentioned something like Adobe Reader or something like the Office 365, like applications, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, et cetera, Outlook. But you may find that an application that you're looking to deploy is not in the catalog, and it happens. And Microsoft, of course, is going to continue to add things into the Microsoft Store. But in the meantime, you know they provide a way for you to do these kinds of deployments. And there's a couple of steps involved. You know you would have to get your application uh, and then convert it into a special uh, Intune file extension that they have. And Microsoft provides you a tool to use that for free. Uh, but again, it requires a little skill behind for you to essentially run the tool, tell it, here's the package I want, and it essentially spits out what it is that you need to upload into Intune, and then you can program how you want that deployment to work. Uh, so a little effort there on that part. Uh, if you're not as tech savvy in those kinds of situations, there are third-party tools that you can use. 
that will, again, they have the ability to sort of take a package for you and then they do that conversion, um, you know, for a small price essentially. And then uh, they connect it to your Intune environment. So it really makes it very seamless. You, you go to their catalog, you choose the product and it gets uh, deployed through the um, Intune system at, for a price, of course. Uh, and then it comes to monitoring and reporting. Intune has a lot of that. Uh, so just by ba when you sign into Intune, there's just going to be a lot of overview pages, dashboards, and widgets to be able to tell you right from the get-go what's in your environment. But then, of course, there's a lot of reporting and monitoring that you could do in the environment. And some of the things you're going to want to look at or be able to see in the environment is going to say who's logged into the device, what kind of device it is, where they've logged in from. It's going to show location, IP address, that sort of thing. Um, there's also going to be a, one of the major things it's going to be about is what applications are installed on the device or whether the device is considered compliant based on how you have everything programmed, right? So if you're looking for a Windows product and running this version, is that compliant? Yes or no. And it gives you sort of that, that type of information. And you could set up within Intune sort of what you do if a device is not compliant, right? You can send the message to the user and say, you're not compliant and you have two days to fix this or else we mark you as not compliant. And then maybe you have rules or policies in place that sort of specify what happens if you're not compliant. Maybe you don't get access to Office 365 because you're not compliant, right? Um, so a lot of that is baked in already in Intune. And if you want to go beyond that, of course, Microsoft provides you things like graph uh, API, essentially to be able to do things, log analytics within Azure. All that is sort of beyond um, the normal stuff that's baked into Intune, but and it requires some skill level to be able to do, but it's there. Great, thank you. Um so now we'll talk a little bit about the policy decisions that need to be made um, when you're considering the implementation. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so Amanda, can you talk a little bit about your policies um, and how, how and why you set those up? Sure. So we started with a pretty um, basic set of policies. I think when we first got started, I will say over time that has obviously grown, right? Because as you start to learn Intune and, and learn how it works and know all of its power, obviously those security policies have really grown over time. Um, I think that when we first started, we started with a pretty basic set of, um, you know, security policy, we want BitLocker enabled, we want secure boot enabled, we want to require an antivirus, we want to require obviously a password on, on any device that accesses map data. Um, we want to have that, that device to have a device lock if it's idle for an amount of time. Um, we want to require a password when it returns from that idle state, just kind of basic things like that. Um, we do have some conditional access policies out there so that um, machines can't access um, map data unless they um, are compliant. So those are some of the types of things that we set up in the beginning. Um, another kind of I tried to think of some some kind of different ones that we set up in the beginning. We did have uh, an issue with Adobe Pro. When we um, started rolling all this out, um, we couldn't get Adobe Pro to update for users because it wanted an admin password. So we had to put users that um, devices that had Adobe Pro into a group so that we could run a script that would go out and check for updates and then allow those updates to run um, and then also make sure that uh, Pro was always set as their de uh, default. So just things like that are just kind of some examples of stuff that we've um, set up and are, are using. We also do use um, groups for uh, troubleshooting and testing at times. You know, we've had, because of autopilot, sometimes um, we'll, um, with our autopilot provisioning process, we'll hit a hiccup somewhere where it won't go through the whole process. So we may create a, a a group to put a machine in to say, okay, you know, maybe exclude it from this policy and then see if the autopilot will run and the, all of the provisioning will finish. So I think there's a lot of things that you can do with um, with uh, policies and, and groups and things, but it just kind of until you get a, a hang of what, how much you can do with it, you know, you start out with kind of the basics. And then I think you also have to kind of remember you don't want those policies to conflict either. So as you start to go out and create these policies, you, know, you, you want to have good policies in place for users so that they're obviously keeping your data safe, but you also don't want to restrict them so much that either those policies start to conflict with each other or they start to really inhibit people's work. 
Great. And uh, Joseph, can you, can you talk, talk a little bit about implementing policies and phases and what that what that might look like? Right. And so Amanda mentioned this uh, just a few seconds ago. It's it's about sort of how you want to sort of roll this out and whether it's the comfort level of your IT staff or the comfort level of your users or just generally how your organization operates. You know, you know your users best of all. And if you're introducing something like Intune, you may have a lot of things in mind that you want to set in terms of policies, right? Maybe you want to require everyone on a smartphone to have a PIN, which is what I think you should have. Uh, but not everyone has a PIN on their smartphone currently. So that's a little bit of a, you know, possibly a learning curve for your users. Uh, there's also requiring that, say, your iPhone or Android or even computers must be Windows 10 or must be this version of iOS or Android which again, there's probably gonna be some users that don't have that version. Um, maybe they have a very old iPhone. So you may be excluding people out of whatever you're doing with Intune, whatever your policies are. Um, or getting used to pushing applications out to devices or you set more security-based policies, right? You wanna prevent people from taking screenshots on a smartphone or copy and pasting data out of one, like say application. Someone gets an Outlook email, it says information in the email and they copy it. They wanna paste it into a text message that may go to someone that's outside the organization. So you set a policy that prevents that from happening. So you could do a lot of things here but it's really going to be a matter of, are you going to do it like ripping a Band-Aid off and all these policies go in at one shot and you kind of make that announcement to your users? Or do you sort of do this bit by bit in phases, essentially, get everyone used to sort of what you're doing with Intune and introduce things as you go along, requiring BitLocker, disabling USB storage so people can pop a flash drive in, that sort of thing. Uh, it, and then it's it's going to come down to again as you grow and Amanda could probably speak to this as well at some point but you know it's it's some you're going to have to create a group maybe specifically for this or that or the other thing right the immigration group needs to be able to get this app deployment and the bankruptcy group needs to be able to do this or that and so you you add complexity to what you're building out there so documentation is going to be very important with what you're doing in Intune you want to be able to remember I've set these policies up for a reason. Here's why these policies affect these people. And here's why. And, you know, frankly, if IT people come and go, right. And so if you hire somebody new or your IT staff is sort of dealing with a support ticket, they should be aware of what's actually configured and, and that it's actually there for everyone. Yeah. And Amanda, you mentioned, you know, the security groups and the policies have changed over time. You started with about 10 to 12 groups and how many are you up to now? <laughs> Oh boy, I'd, I'd guess over 50. I I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, right. I, you know, Joseph, that's a great point though. I will say we do have one funder that um, requires much higher levels of security than our other funders. And because of that, again, we've had to use some, some um, security groups to, to limit those users who are, who are funded by that um, funder where they um, may be able to not say, um, download things from a browser or not allow them to sync OneDrive or, you know, things like that where some of our other funders don't have those restrictions. So you may not have to, to place those on, on all your staff, but for, for anybody covered by that one funder, it's, it's required. Yeah. And, and have you ever, have you rolled out any policies where um, the user experience ended up being like, this just isn't working for us and you've had to kind of roll it back because this sort of, you know, as Joseph was talking about, there's there's this balance between trying to make sure you're being as protective as possible, but also your users have to be able to use <laughs> the systems, right? So has, has that ever happened for you guys? It has. I can think of a time or two where not so much maybe it interfered with the user per se, but it either maybe conflicted with another policy or it just, it restricted things more than what we had actually thought about and didn't actually, you know, our full, our full intention didn't, it, you know, just, we didn't get the result we wanted. So. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah so, it, I mean, I think the, the, the takeaway is that these policies um, it's, it's kind of an evolving living thing that it's never going to be like, we just sit down and figure this out, write it all down and we're done. Um, um, but uh, yeah, and so it's definitely a very active part of the ongoing use of uh, of MDM. I will say we're very fortunate here at MAP. We have, I think, a few staff in every um, part of our organization that are very useful and always happy to help us test things. So, you know, test, 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 right? If you're going to roll something out, 
to an entire section of your organization that could maybe have some negative impacts, test it first and see what happens. And I mean, we do kind of always use that as a rule of thumb and, and try to do that before we roll something out to a whole entire group of, of people, so. Great, but yeah, that's great advice. Um, great, so I think we have another poll coming up. So not to put people on the spot, but regarding security groups in your organization um, and policies, does your organization have written documentation that someone uh, could, you know, someone could follow if your if your admin disappeared? So we'll just take a couple of seconds. Right. Well, I, I'm I'm encouraged to see eighteen or uh, forty five percent said yes. You know, of the eighteen percent and the thirty six percent that said no, or what policies? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely um, a lot that you can kind of um, glean from this presentation. But I'm sure um, you know we'll be continuing to to find ways for the community to share about um, about what they've done, because really there's no reason to necessarily reinvent the wheel as much as you have to kind of fine tune this stuff for your organization. There's a lot of basics that I think um, we can all kind of learn from one another. Great. Um, yeah, so Joseph and Amanda, if you guys wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the training and help desk issues that uh, come up with implementing MDM? Sure, I could start, Amanda. Yeah. Um, I'd say probably one of the, some of the more typical things is uh, forgetting whether a the actual license that is required for Intune is applied to the user account. Uh, it's it's easy to forget. Um, it's also something that I, I'd say, I've even seen sometimes some functions work without the license. Um, with an Intune, that's more Microsoft sort of back end. I know you're not allowed to um, use their products without the licensing, but some things are a bit of a, a loophole and you can get in and start using it. I don't suggest doing that. You should certainly follow the, the EULA, the end user license agreement for Microsoft. But one of the very first things that you come across if let's say you open a ticket with Microsoft support and say, why isn't this working? That's going to be one of the first things they're going to look at. Right? Is the user account properly licensed to be able to use it? Um, other things that are come, going to come up, and I talked about this earlier, right, is if you have a policy that states, you know, whether you have to have a certain version of like an operating system, um, and then a user calls up and says, hey, this is not working, right, and you forget that you have that set in your policy, uh, then that's something you're going to miss, right? These are just basic training and help desk type of issues that you sort of want to look for. Um, another one to look out for, and I think uh, Amanda's got some information on this one as well, is if you're if you're going to be doing enrollment of like, say, bring your own device, people's personal devices, and you discover that a lot of them have Macs, right? And maybe you weren't prepared for supporting Macs. Uh, and so that's that's a big thing to sort of look out. Like, what are the devices that are being enrolled or what are, what are the devices that people are using? And do you know a Mac? Does the IT staff know how to function with a Mac? Like what, where's the line that you're sort of drawing with that kind of support? <clears throat> um, more things could just be simple stuff. Like if you're doing app deployments uh, and maybe the device doesn't have enough storage space, right? Um, or if it's gonna be something like uh, restrictions, like if you have a, a policy for preventing data from leaving your organization, right? Being able to do that copy and paste. And I've, I've been in these situations before, right? I learned that I have a policy in place that does not allow you to take data out from one Microsoft managed application and putting it something outside of Microsoft, uh, like in Gmail or something like that. Uh, and it doesn't work, right? And then you discover that, hey, the users actually have a business purpose for this. And it's like, okay, well, like T Tony says, not everything's set in stone here, right? You have to go back into the policy and maybe change the way that you have your policies configured or you do exceptions, right? You're allowing this application because people actually use it. You didn't know about it, shadow IT. Um, and then now it's part of the sort of the policy. Uh, so yeah, I... Okay. So go ahead, Amanda. I'm sorry. I was just going to say the only thing I would recommend is communication, communication, communication with your users. But go ahead. 
Yes, yes. We we have a bit of an unusual setup, I think, here at Map because we um, had Google Workspace. We made this move to Microsoft, but we kept Google. And so we used the two of them together, which a lot of people told us was a bad idea, um, but we proceeded anyway, and it's worked wonderfully, I will say. Um, we we use Google for our single sign-on. Our map, our staff use personal cell phones for multi-factor authentication. Um, we did encounter some hurdles when we first um, got into enrolling with because of the Google Microsoft um, setup that we have. Um, but we were able to work through um, quite a few of those either with Microsoft support or um, by basically Googling other organizations that were doing the same thing and had already resolved some of the issues that we were seeing. Um, I will uh, I will agree that Macs are, are not a pleasant experience. If you have a lot of Macs and they're moving to Intune, it's, it's not a good experience. Um, we actually got thrown into that during COVID because we didn't have enough machines. Laptop, laptops were made to work remotely. And so some staff were using uh, personal Macs for a period of time just so they could continue to work. And um, it did not go well. We we did. We got thrown into it with only one staff who was really um, trained and, and knew Macs well. Um, and but I think, you know, we even the same way through through Microsoft support and some Googling and just trying to figure out each each um, issue that we saw, we worked through it. But thankfully, now we've got all um, map equipment for all staff. So there are are no more Macs, and um, I shouldn't say no more. We do have a few, um, but not that we're required to support. So it's great. Um, I think that we spent a ton of, like I said, communication to staff, um, and we still do when things change. Of you know, this is what you're going to see. Here's what you should expect. Um, when we did this rollout, we sent two IT staff to um, each office when we rolled out that into deployment in their offices, and I think that really made them feel better just to have two IT people that are dedicated to help them in person to answer their questions. I think that really um, made a huge, a huge difference. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, and and Joseph, can you talk a little bit about your experience in terms of training and and how you go about uh, supporting rollouts? Yeah, a lot of it is just the communication side of things, right? The, the proper screenshots, um, the documentations that, that users understand sort of what's happening and having even your own IT staff be aware of it, right? They have to be prepared for, you know, the day you're enabling this stuff, that yeah, everyone's sort of all hands on deck to be able to solve those kinds of issues. And especially if your team doesn't have a, a experience with Intune itself, right? There's You should have a bit of a training with your staff so that they are familiar with Intune before it actually goes live, right? Maybe you set up a beta environment with just the IT team, right? Enroll your devices, roll, enroll your smartphones and play around with the policies, right? Internally, just within IT. And then you can go back to your management team, your executive team and be like, here's what we found works and what doesn't work. And here's what we recommend should be turned on, right? And the management team or the executive team, you know, sort of you you work with them on what their expectations are. And I'll, I'll guarantee you, once it rolls out, right, there's going to be some other changes that are going to happen just because nobody was aware of X, Y, and Z. So- a lot of it is is that is going to be that piece. Flipping okay. switches is easy. We just say <laughs> from an IT perspective, going in and and setting something from a yes to a no or adding a check spot check box is fine, but it's the ramifications that you have to deal with. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's all well and good to to like have your configuration set perfectly. If there's uh, un, until there's like a. a user riot over <laughs> all over how much change they're being asked to absorb. Great. Um, so we've been talking about the process and some of the things you have to think through and prepare. Why don't we talk a little bit about the benefits um, on the next slide? Um, some of the benefits of implementing MDM and Intune. Um, we've touched on some of these things, but definitely I think it's it's worth repeating some of the ways this will, will help your organization. So um, yeah, Joseph, you want to get us started? Sure. I'd say one of the main things that I've seen a lot of organizations are, are really interested in, in into or sort of an MDM type of product is primarily two things. It's going to be because they want to be able to wipe a device if, say, a user loses or gets their device stolen, or more importantly, if a user decides to leave the organization, what's happening to the data that they have? 
And if, if you were in an organization that had enough money to be able to buy a, a laptop for all of your you know, staff and even interns, then much less of an issue. You just get that device back. Hopefully you get the device back. I've been in situations where that has not happened either. But, you know, especially if you're allowing the a BYOD type of environment to bring your own device, um, what's happening to all the data that was sitting on someone's personal device? And from an IT perspective, I have no idea what they're doing on that device. I have no idea what's installed on that device. Um, is it up to date? And then are they saving things locally to their, their own personal laptop? And then they say goodbye and they're taking all that data with them, right? So a lot of that is that, that level of control to be able to wipe a device remotely or wipe at least the company data off the device, maybe not the entire sort of device itself. It uh, depends on the situation. Uh, and then a lot of it is going to be data leakage as well. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier, right? Being able to control where that data is allowed to go to. So you don't want to let somebody do a, a screen capture on the phone. You don't want to be able to sort of copy and paste that data out of an environment and into something else, right? You could turn that on. You could even turn on the capability to prevent printing from like a smartphone, for instance. And again, depends on your environment. I've been in situations where that's usually what I recommend for people to do. And then the organization says yes. And then they discover, oh, wait, no, we actually need to be able to print from XYZ because someone's at a courthouse, for instance, right? And so that you sort of backtrack and you make the change again. Um, so it's really a lot of that enhanced security to be able to do that type of things. Uh, the other piece here, and, and Amanda mentioned this earlier, is, is streamlining sort of what that device management is like. You, you get devices purchased, they come from Dell, they get pushed out with um, uh, autopilot, they get they all get the same kind of applications, right? You, you sort of know what you're getting when you, you set up sort of that process. <laughs> and a lot of it's going to be also just the user productivity, right? Everyone knows what everyone should have. The IT staff knows what should be there. Um, if there was a situation where a laptop blew up and you need to give them a new laptop, right? It's the same build and they know what they're getting when they open it back up, right? It's not going to be a different experience. Oh, I, on my last computer, I had Adobe Pro, but now this is Nuance. I don't know how to use Nuance, right? So you keep everything consistent in that way. <laughs> Sorry about that. Great. And uh, Amanda, you want to talk a little bit about some of the cost savings and efficiency gains? Sure, sure. I, you know, what's funny, I would, I would say that efficiency and cost savings are the two probably biggest things that we've um, accomplished with this change, but it's also security and visibility, right? I mean, we've gained a ton of that that we couldn't see before, um, you know, in, in Intune being able to see devices and, um, you know, now we can see the last IP address it connected to, the last known location, um, the applications it's accessed. We can see so many more things now that we used to not be able to see um, with our the old platform that we had. Um, I, I do think we've obviously saved a ton of time and cost from, you know, we used to have devices shipped here to one location in Ipsy and take them to 10 different locations in you know, Southeastern Michigan, which seems crazy now, but that's what we used to do. Um, you know, that's all mileage and IT time and, and everything that, you know, just we don't have to do now. The, the machines just all ship right to the location. The user signs into it. You know, the auto the autopilot provisioning kicks on, loads all of our policies, all their, I mean, it's just, it's great. It's a great experience and, and so much easier to manage. Um, I think, again, for our help desk, it's, it's also just, light years better because every time they connect a machine, they know what they're going to see. And I think it's also easier to troubleshoot things because if you see an issue on one machine, you know that you, you may likely see that on five, you know, what other machines are in that same group um, of devices with whatever they have access to, you know. Um, I think one other benefit from Intune also is that, you know, Microsoft does come up with new, uh, new, new options every day inside of Intune and you get to take advantage of those options. Most are good. Sometimes they might break something else, which is a bad day, but 99% um, of the time, they're all good advancements. And so you get to, to take advantage of all of those in real time. And I think that's great too. Um, it's great. You can also, we can also now um, basically deploy any app to any device. Um, we use the company portal. That's how we send out um, apps to, to our staff. And you can just do, send it to every, everybody in the, in the, organization very quickly, which is a, we used to not be able to do that prior to um, having into either. So. Yeah, great. So definitely, yeah, definitely a lot of upside for organizations um, 
and it sounds like from your experience that upside far outweighs the you know the the learning curve and the the change that you guys had to undergo um great so then uh the next topic is is a pretty big one um probably one that you know would uh, generate a lot of discussion within an organization. But um, so, you know, we want to talk a little bit about the overlap of MDM and bring your own device, um, <clears throat> bring, uh, you know, staff bringing their own devices, using their own devices for organization um, work. So, um, just what does it mean to enroll a, a, a user's personal device into an MDM uh, platform? Uh, it means that you, as the organization, has have some level of control over the device, and uh, and that that's the the scary sort of language that you know some users will kind of say, no, I, well, I don't want that, right? And uh, my Microsoft, and we we share this in a later slide. Microsoft has a link that that sort of explains what it is that an organization can see when a device is enrolled, so that's helpful for you to look at, and and you know have users understand. You know, if if I enroll my smartphone, my personal smartphone, what what is it that you can do? What what can I do? Briefly, I can push out an application to your device. Do you like that? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Right from a personal user perspective, uh, but you know, I'm pushing out something like Outlook, maybe because that's something you're going to need most likely to check your work email on. So it it's, makes sense. But that also means I could probably push out something like um, Candy Crush. Right, which again, you're you're not going to want. Um, there's also other things, right? Like I won't be able to read your text messages, for instance, from your smartphone, or like see your browser history on your computer. But it's it's where sort of the line is drawn, right? There's a little bit of a misconception of what can be done and what can be seen. But there's a bit of a gray area, right? If if I'm pushing on an application that's allowing me um, to do like Team Viewer, for instance, I could remotely connect to your device, right? Intune itself is doesn't give me the privilege, but now that the that application does give me the ability to get to your device and do things to it. Um, so it's again, it's 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 going to be a big conversation in your environment. Um, I'm going to be able to see who signed into it, like the name that's on there, the type of device you have, the serial number of it, the inventory of the software that's there, the geographical location, right? I'll look at your IP address. It's going to show that it's from New York or from Boston or somewhere else. I know where you are based on your signing in. And that's not even generally due to enrollment. Just Microsoft, when you sign into Office 365, I as an admin can look at the logs and see that you are vacationing in Japan. And good for you for being on vacation, but I know you're in Japan, right? And that's going to be important for your policies because if you had a policy set up that says you're only allowed to log into your know, Office 365 from within the United States and you decide to go on vacation and you really should not be working when you're on vacation. But if you do and, and it doesn't let you in, you know, the user is going to call in and say, hey, I can't work, sadly, from when I'm on vacation in Japan. And it's like, OK, well, I have to set an exception in to allow you sort of um, in from your environment. Right. <clears throat> But it's, it's um, you know, it could be seen in both ways, whether it's intrusive or it's helpful. And I've seen in, in my personal experience with a lot of organizations that there is pushback um, from users and users like to have that control. I've seen attorneys sort of use their smartphone to be able to communicate with their clients, send a text message, have these phone calls, send files over, and they do it all the time. But from an organization perspective, if they're if the organization is telling you this is how it's going to be done, that's when the user pushes back. Like, I, I want to be able to say what I do, not have the organization tell me what to do. Um, so it is it is a sensitive discussion to have. And unless you, your organization has a money to essentially buy smartphones for everyone and, and buy laptops for everyone, then you may have no choice but to do BYOD. And yeah. it's important to protect the, the company data. And I think any attorney would understand that as well, right? The, the importance of uh, securing that information. Yeah, and can you, um, so two things. One, um, there was a question in the chat about um, what kind of security risks have you seen when there's, um, when you allow, bring your own device. And then can you just for the sake of kind of maybe establishing some context, kind of talk about like, the difference between, um, like you were saying, if you need Microsoft Outlook um, on a mobile device, you can push it out. But what's to stop the user from just going to the App Store and downloading Outlook and signing in directly, right? So can you 
kind of uh, right. Yeah. So two things, right? You could push out the application just because in advance you know that they're going to need it and you're being helpful. Um, you could instruct users to go out and download Outlook because you know they need the work device, but you could set up policies and and go, this goes back to um, the compliance policies, right? Is your device enrolled? You could have that as part of your policy. And if your device is not enrolled, then you can access Office 365 email, right? right. So sure, download Outlook as much as you like, try to sign in. And when you do, it'll pop up and be like, well, you can't do that because you're not enrolled. So now you're requiring people to be enrolled in order for you to be able to access that company data. So that's how you could secure that piece of it. Um, in terms of what the security risk is for people's personal devices, <clears throat> if I'd say in a lot of ways with Intune, you're, you're minimizing the security risk now because now you're requiring people to be on a certain OS version or that a device is bit lockered and encrypted uh, or that it has a pin on the smartphone. You're making up the rules and if they don't follow it, they can't access the data. Uh, but some of the risks could be, for instance, um, especially on someone's personal device, right? I don't know what antivirus they have installed on their computer. Um, and I've seen organizations sort of do the, the low budget way of saying like everyone on paper, right? Policy, paper policy. Everyone needs to have antivirus installed on their their personal devices and everyone will nod their head and maybe you set up a system where they have to send you a screenshot or the IT admin has to like log into your device remotely in some way to demonstrate, yes, I, I have antivirus installed. But, you know, maybe you do a check every month for everyone to do that. But there's nothing that stops a user from ending the call and then uninstalling the antivirus, right? Or that they, you know, they purchased McAfee for three months and then after three months, it's not working anymore because they haven't paid for it anymore and now it's out of date, right? So there's a lot of holes with not using something like Intune because now if you do have Intune and you use the endpoint detection and response components, right? That's, that's being pushed out to these devices. So now you're protecting these devices with your Microsoft products. And now, you know, whether they had an antivirus or not, right, they have something that is actually protecting the company data on there. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so as you're saying, you know, MDM is to kind of plug the holes of bring your own device policies that um, expose a lot of risk to um, organizations. And kind of what we were talking about earlier, um, a lot of these applications are you know, the data is cloud-based or, you know, the applications, um, the clients are easy to install, you know, independently. And I know that, like, you know, um, Amanda was alluding to the fact that you were fortunate to kind of be, have been moving into this prior to the pandemic. A lot of organizations, when the pandemic struck, you know, were just saying, look, if you have a computer at home, use your computer at home. And so people were probably installing Microsoft Teams and Outlook and, and accessing data directly through those client apps without a lot of these kind of, um, you know, um, protections of an MDM system to be able to kind of really control what, um, you know, how that data was being used and kept and, you know, potentially saved and transmitted you know, through other applications on the laptop. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, web filtering on, on BYOD and, and issues around, um, I guess, web filtering, but also, you know, like you can, you know, there's Outlook online. So wouldn't you be able to just, you know, access Outlook in the web browser and and circumvent, you know, something if, if the device isn't registered? Yeah, so I do know that Intune uh, this is not something I've personally played with too much with it into, but yes, Intune does have the capability to do web filtering, and it most like most other web filtering products, it, it goes based on categories. Um, so there's you know there's the database that sort of says you know Google.com is this type of website, like search engine, um, but if you're visiting something like um, a legal organization or if you're visiting some sort of gun website or weapon website, they fall under different categories, and you define what you're doing with those categories, whether you're allowing them in or not. Um, and just like any other web filtering sort of capabilities, you're gonna come across issues where maybe a, a website's been miscategorized uh, and you may need to either, you know, submit some sort of feedback to Microsoft or your web filtering sort of provider and say, hey, this is wrong, it should be changed, then you could set up e exceptions, right? Um, or maybe some users need to be able to visit the these types of websites, but not other users. So you could set up that that sort of policy stuff with it into. And that that can apply to BYOD, like you uh, you could 
set up web filtering to prevent uh, access to certain sites on yes a I'd say device. though I'd say though that a lot of it with Intune and again I'm not an expert with sort of the web filtering stuff but I do know that Intune does want you to use more edge as sort of the web browsing um, uh, software you're using on the device because right. of course Microsoft is going to have more control over what it could do with an edge than versus say Chrome or anything else um, so if you were looking to do things like the uh, from a Windows 10 device like adding certificates or trusted websites or things of that nature then it's most likely going to try to push you towards using edge instead right so it could be a scenario where for work purposes the official browser is edge but you know if it's a personal device people can continue to use Chrome for their own their own internet yeah. browsing yeah um and then just uh, that other question so is there potentially a loophole with being able to get into outlook from any web browser is that also something that can be controlled um yeah, I mean, it's going to depend on how you set up your policies. And so, you know, from an administrative pers perspective, you should have the right policies in place for what you want to do. Like, for instance, you could set up a policy that says you, and I mentioned this earlier, right? You you uh, must be enrolled and compliant, not just enrolled, but you have to be compliant in order for you to access email. Um, and so, it's possibility that a device becomes no longer compliant because uh, maybe he was looking for antivirus and now it's been uninstalled by the user. So therefore it's non-compliant. It'll show up as non-compliant and in tune, right? But then what do you do with that information, right? You could set up the policy that says, if you're not compliant, you don't get access to email. And simple as that, right? Like that it's going to be dependent on how you set up your policies and what you want to do with it. Great. Yeah. And Amanda, can you talk a little bit about your experience um, kind of in rolling this out and having conversations with your staff about bring your own device and, and, and what you've heard? Yeah, we obviously during, again, during COVID, everything goes back to COVID. Um, we did have to, staff did use personal machines for, for a good part of the time while we waited, you know, everything was backed up because of COVID. We couldn't get laptops, couldn't get, you know, it took forever. Um, we did, uh, have staff um, enroll devices. Um, we didn't, I will say, didn't get a lot of pushback from staff on that. I've heard other organizations that, um, you know, have really had a lot of resistance to that. Um, our staff use their personal cell phones for multi-factor. Um, we've never had pushback on that. Um, we do allow staff to to access things on cell phones, they do have to enroll the devices um, and in tune if they're going to access anything, any map data. And it's just like any other map device that has to be compliant in order to access any of those things. We do keep personal and map devices in two different groups. Um, so, you know, one thing I guess to kind of keep in mind is, well, at least I can only speak for, for map, you know, we don't, all of the policies that we have out there for map devices, we obviously wouldn't want to push all of those out to personal devices, right? So we do keep those in two separate groups. Um, we do keep some of the some of the restrictions for personal devices, like it has to have a, a pin on it or a password. It has to um, lock, you know, after a certain period of time if it's left idle. Um, things like that for obviously security purposes. But um, we don't obviously push all of our security um, policies out to, to personal devices. Great. Yeah. So that's a great example of like if somebody is really just intent on not enrolling their device, at the very least, you know, use your just get the authenticator app and use it for MFA. You know, we can't mm -hmm. see anything about your device. Right. We're not, you know, you're installing it yourself. You can delete it yourself, all, you know, but, you know, it's still helping at least with the security um, of, you know, of your systems um, in that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a obviously a very, very rich topic for discussion. Um, I'm sure there's probably a lot of thoughts going through everyone's heads right now <laughs> about this. Um, and, and maybe a lot of organizations that haven't really thought through their being bring your own device. And um, this is, you know, definitely a good opportunity now to start to really start thinking about it because um, I can tell you from our experience, bring your own device policy and organizations that allow bring your own device that don't have systems like this. Um, it's almost inevitable that there's going to be data living on on people's personal devices in one way or another, right? Whether, you know, on a mobile phone, you've downloaded a file because you want to use it in a different app and it's sitting in your files folder and, or the same thing on on, uh, on a laptop. And, and so I think, um, 
this is as good a time as any to get started because um because that that stuff is only going to continue to grow <laughs> as uh, as we continue to exist in a hybrid work world um yeah so where does that take us next um next slide you know and where where do we go from here there's you know i i, I do think that for organizational or the or devices owned by the organization it's definitely a lot less controversial right um and it's more just about learning to adapt to changes and i think with bring your own device that is definitely a, a big uh discussion that has to be had internally with with your with your staff to kind of understand and from my perspective um in preparing for this one thing that really occurred to me it's really about the organization expressing its expectations of of its staff right like we you know we want you to enroll your devices because we need you to be able to check email at court and we can't afford to give you a mobile device right and and so you, we need you to be accessible if you're going to be at court for half the day and you know those types of conversations and and if that's not if it's still you know something that staff are just really not um willing to do then trying to think you know negotiate alternatives like what are some some options then what are what are things that we can do to kind of um figure out how we accomplish you know accommodate a certain need that the organization has or a need that the the staff person has um so you know that that balance of maintaining you know maintaining organizational data and security versus the employees privacy like that you know and and their own comfort level is is definitely i think one of the main issues with bring your own device and then you know when it comes to just uh organizational devices i think it's like hopefully you know joseph and amanda have given you guys a lot of food for thought if you don't already have a, a system like this in place but um it seems like it, there's uh there's really not a lot of downside to to really trying to uh simplify and streamline processes and, and make it a lot easier to administer um, your machines. Um, yeah, and I don't know, Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about um, sort of change management? Um, sure, your, I your think desk, your desk phone versus soft phone uh, <laughs> story. <laughs> that is, that's always a great example. You know, I think it's I think it, if there's one thing I've learned, it's the more you communicate change to people, the better they accept it, and the better they adapt to it. And I think the I think the more you explain to people the benefits of the change and and why you're making that decision, they also accept it, you know, uh, much more positively than if you just tell them we're doing this and 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 you have no say in the matter and this is that this is how it is. You know, I think if you communicate to them and you explain it, I think it it has a much more you know positive outcome and I, I do always like to tell the ring central story because you know it's we we moved to ring central um during covid right before covid and um i explained to people that ring central hasn't had an app they have a soft phone, a soft phone platform for your for your uh laptop everybody still wanted desk phones so i think i ordered almost 200 desk phones for people because nobody wanted to part with their desk phone and i think currently in our server room we probably have 145 dust phones because nobody wants the dust phones, right? They, they just, they all adapted. And once they got used to it after, you know, two week period, nobody wanted those dust phones anymore. So it's just, I think it's just a, it's a process for people to adapt to change. And I think the more you communicate to them, the reasons why you're doing something and the the positive effect and the good change from it, I think, you know, the, they'll accept it. And I think, you know, it's, it's just kind of one of those things everybody has to adjust. Great. Yeah, I think that's a great example of of kind of how change management is sometimes just has to happen the way it has to happen. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I don't know if there were any other questions that we didn't get to. Um, looks like we're at the top of the hour. So um, here are some useful links. I think the slides are available to all the attendees um, and then the recording will be posted as well um, at LSNTAP. And then um, 
I I think we were meant to put our email addresses on the contact us. So maybe when in the in the version that gets distributed, we can update <laughs> update the slides so that if you have any questions, um, you can uh, send them to us. And I guess with that, Shelly, I'll pass it back to you to close us out. Well, that was awesome. I know that I picked up a few things, learned a few things about even my own organization and how things um, worked. And I do want to invite everyone, if you're interested in learning more about the BYOD, we are having the webinar on the 24th that will give a little more information about that. We will have this posted to our YouTube channel in just a few days, and that will include the slides. We welcome suggestions. If you are not mem a member of our LSNTAP listserv community, you can join right on our homepage at lsntap.org. And thank you very much for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.